Uh, welcome to the fifth day of this DA Iconic Week. Uh, we have our second heritage lecture for this week, which will be delivered by Professor Shiru Roy Chaudhary. Uh, to introduce Professor Shiru Roy Chaudhary, I invite our director, Professor Ravindra. Good afternoon. I think it's a great pleasure to have uh, my old friend uh, Sirup here with us. Um, I don't think Sirup requires any introduction, but uh, for the benefit of the younger audience, uh, Sirup is a high energy physicist, very well known in India abroad. Um, he uh, did his PhD from uh, Calcutta University and uh, moved to TIFR. Uh, in fact, I knew him from my student time, and I had an opportunity to actually, uh, you know, stay in the same corridor for almost two years as postdocs. We were postdocs together, and also neighbors in the apartments. Um, and uh, he's also, um, and then after that, actually, after he moved to TIFR, he went to TIFR, uh, CERN to do his next postdoc, and then he joined uh, IIT Kanpur, and uh, I. I hear from people actually the kind of courses that he gave and uh, there are a lot of uh, fans for him actually, even in our institute. He was he's a great teacher and uh, uh, he's a great uh, researcher as well. And after that, uh, he moved to TIFR. I don't know since when he's in TIFR. 2007, he's in TIFR as the faculty professor over there and also taking care of a lot of administrative duties. Uh, I mean, he's known for many things, actually worked on electroweak interactions. Name anything in high energy physics, he has contributions. And <laughs> maybe there are things that are irrelevant where he has not contributions, but most of the relevant things he has contributions. And he has written several textbooks, uh, both at the graduate level, also for the advanced uh, level. Uh, there are also books, actually, that was written for the first time in that area, actually. Uh, the one book is actually a book on uh, extra dimension models. Uh, a few years back, we was, this was uh, you know one of the hot topics in physics, and he and uh, another professor Sridhar they wrote a first book in that field actually. So uh, we have a person in India who has written a first book on a particular topic, which was you know most popular uh, for several years actually. Even now, it's one of the pop most popular ones. And Sridhar is also known for um, uh, you know uh, known for popularizing uh, science in. Very, very different ways, actually, particularly talking about uh, uh, contribution, Indians' contributions to Indian science or world science and things like that. Uh, he's pretty known for these things, history of science. He had come here also to give such a talk. Okay, I think many of us, many of our senior colleagues would have uh, listened to it. And when uh, we, when, when we actually started this, you know, 60 years of IMSC, I think one of the things that uh, we wanted to do is actually to have series of talks on heritage. Okay, and uh, the first person which came to my mind actually because it's my also good friend, uh, Sirup, and we already had uh, two talks by TRJ, I think. Okay, he might give even third talk actually <laughs> if he's allowed. And Sirup is the I think the th third or fourth one actually in this iconic week of several uh, you know heritage talks. I'm really happy to have him here for this talk. I don't want to take too much time on this. And let me invite uh, Professor Sirup. So good evening, everyone. And thanks, Ravindran, for that very warm introduction. You have hyped me too much, I think, and raised the expectations of the audience to an extent which I'm sure I will not be able to fulfill. Anyway, so I have been visiting IMSC as some of the senior people know, for many, many years. And it turns out that every time I visit, I give a talk and there is less and less science in the talks as the years go by. So this is the talk which will have a minimum amount of science. And I will, it is a mixture, mixture of science and history and about how things grew in India. It's a wonderful story. It's also perhaps a nice story. The nice thing too, remember in our iconic week of the 75th anniversary of independence. So let's start. So this is our Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav week. But what I will be talking about is the evolution of modern science 
in India. And this picture itself is a tribute to modern science in India. This is, was taken by the Chandrayaan-2 orbiter. This is the crater called Sommerfeld, where the lander was supposed to land. Of course, it didn't land, it crashed somewhere else. That's a different story. This, this is named Kirkwood, as you can see. But this itself is a triumph, the fact that you know we can go now at, to the moon and take pictures there. But let's begin this story at the beginning. So we'll start with ancient India. And of course, you have heard a lot about this from TRG, so I will not spend too much time on it. We know that there was a glorious history starting right back from the days of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. And I will just focus on four of these things. One is the discovery of the zero. This is a picture of a little part of the famous Bakshali manuscript dating to the probably to the second century before common era. Then, of course, there is the atomic theory of Sage Kanad, Vaisheshik Darshan, also there in all the textbooks. Then these frightening looking instruments come from the uh, Sushut Samhita, which has all these interesting names and frightening looking instruments for surgery, showing that the surgery was highly developed. And last but not least is the discovery of steel. So steel, of course, was discovered in India, in this part of the country. And it was known to the Europeans as wood steel. So it is from this wood steel, which was originally discovered by the blacksmiths of South India, mostly Tamil Nadu, that the tra Arab traders learned to make steel. And it was from here that the famous Damascus blades, Damascus swords of the Middle Ages, from Damascus, the Spanish Toledo swords and Toledo armor was all made, it was basically wood steel. The same skills traveled to Japan, and the samurai swords, which are seen in museums there, are also made of the same, with this, roughly the same techniques. So these are some glorious achievements. And of course, there was building. So I show you a picture here of the Kailashnath temple at Elora. So the fantastic thing about this, if you've been there, is that this is one piece of rock. It's carved out of the mountain. It's the biggest standing free sculpture in the world. If you zoom out, you can see how it's cut out of the mountain. Certainly the biggest statue in the world. Now, I would also like to point out that, of course, these are nice things. But this dates to about 7, was completed around 750 of the common era. Now, of course, it wasn't done in one year. It must have taken a couple of decades before that to slowly build it. But during that same time, if you look at North India, so I'm showing you the ruins of what is left of Kila Rai Pithora in Delhi, which was built by the Tomar King Anangpal around 731. And this is part today of the Purana Kila complex. You can go and see it. Just look at the structure. It is so much more crude. Different stones put together, Look at this structure, compare it with the beauty and excellence of the Kailashna temple. This shows you that by this time, science, so architecture is a reflection of the science and technology of the times, was already in decline. And this is well known. And the, the reasons for this, this is, have been pointed out in his famous book on Hindu chemistry, by Acharya, none other than Acharya Prafula Chandrarai. So what are the reasons he gives? The first reason he mentions is the rise of otherworldliness. You know, the Advaita preached by Adi Shankara. What does it tell us? The world is illusion, maya. Not worth thinking about. The result of this is that in all his followers, they started thinking about the material world as something useless be thinking about spiritual things, about how to unite with the, with the, the God. The result is, of course, if the word, material world is useless, you don't worry about its properties. You don't worry about what it does. So the interest moved away from material objects, which is what science is about. The second thing is that around this time, the caste system and the Manu Samhita 
was written earlier, but it reached its final form in this state. It cemented the caste system. What was the result of this? That the Brahmins, who were doing the thinking work, the thinking and writing, they never did anything with their hands. The artisans who were doing things with their hands, they just passed on the Lord from father to son. Nobody bothered to think about the principles. This was something they were doing for their living. And they were not talking to the Brahmins. The Brahmins were not talking to them. This was the second reason. The third reason, which is perhaps the strongest reason, was the impoverishment of Hindu princes through internecine warfare. So if you look at the history of the 7th and 8th centuries, it's a dreary story of this kingdom fighting that kingdom, that kingdom fighting this kingdom, this fort being grabbed from this kingdom and going to that kingdom and so on. The kings were fighting among themselves all the time. Wars cost money, so they had no money to patronize science. Science cannot grow without patronage, it needs money. It needs help. Science, arts, all need patronage. The kings were the patrons of these. We know about Vikramaditya and his Navaratna. Without the patronage, science actually died. What happened? You have to turn science to something which gives you quick money. So that's when these things started rising. Astrology, alchemy, black magic. It's, if you want to earn money quickly and you have some knowledge, much easier rather than to do astronomy to do astrology and, and set yourself up as an astrologer. Even easier to become a Baba and promise that you will do this and that rather than to think of, say that I'm a philosopher and think about the nature. So these things rose partly because the thinkers had to support themselves. They did not get the patronage to do free thinking. So the result was that already by the time we reached the 12th century, this science and technology was already in decline. And then the death blow came with the invasion of the Turkish conquerors who came from uh, essentially from Central Asia, then settled in Afghanistan and Eastern Persia, and then they attacked India. With these people, basically, this all of the whatever remained of science and technology, most of it was washed away. And here is one symbol of that. These are the ruins of Nalanda University in, in, in modern Bihar. And as we know, this was destroyed by the troops of Iktyar Adin Muhammad bin Bakhtiar Khilji in 1198. The story of how this was destroyed, it also makes interesting reading. A contemporary historian who actually fought with Bakhtiar Khilji says that they initially thought this, the big buildings of Nalanda, they thought it was a fortress. So they attacked it, they fired cannons and things at it. Then they found that the soldiers came out without weapons. The soldiers had shaven heads and they came out without weapons and they were chanting something in some strange language. Of course, they were the Buddhist monks and I guess we know what they were chanting. So they said, these are strange soldiers but they must be knowing some magic or something. So let's kill them all. So they killed all the monks, all the quote unquote soldiers and then they looted the place. When they looted it, they couldn't find any. No gold, no silver nothing precious, only lots and lots of books and manuscripts. So then they got angry and they burnt all those books and manuscripts. So with the destruction of Nalanda University, we sort of, that is the time when we say that the Dark Ages descended upon India. And these Dark Ages lasted roughly from the period from about 1200 to 750. Now I should mention that this age, is, when I say Dark Ages, it's a sort of average over the, over the country. It doesn't mean it was everything was dark. We have these magnificent examples of architecture. Uh, you, you know what they are, Taj Mahal, the Golgambas, the Konal Temple, all these came up during this period. And for pure science and pure thought, of course the Kerala School of Mathematics flourished during this period. Though of course by about the 16th century, they had the most of the work had petered out, it had got lost. So it's not, not that nothing happened, but over the bulk of the country, science and technology and scientific thought had sort of disappeared. It is only around 1750 that they started coming back. And one example of that we see today in the Jantar Mantar, the things built by Maharaja Savai Jai Singh of Ambar, who is often quoted as a scientist around 1734. So you see towards the end of that period. 
But do you know what was the purpose of these Jantar Mantra? It was not astronomy, it was astrology. And there's an interesting story here. Because Jai Singh was a courtier in the court of Emperor Aurangzeb. Now everyone knows that Aurangzeb was a deeply suspicious person. So all his courtiers went in danger that any time the emperor would be angry with them and they would lose their heads. So Jai Singh was no exception. So he kept running to his astrologers telling them, tomorrow will I be alive? Will I be alive in the morning? Will I be alive in the after afternoon? Will the emperor still be happy with him? So the astrologers told him, if you want that kind of accurate knowledge, we have to be accurately measure, measure the positions of the planets and stars. So that's why he built this. It was not out of pure scientific curiosity. I don't know. I don't know how well the astrologers did, but certainly Savai Jai Singh died in his bed. He, he, was, he didn't fall foul of Aurangzeb. Okay, so essentially, we have to accept that Western science came into India with the Westerners. It was the European advent into India where which brought their science with them. And of course we know that Vasco da Gama arrived in Kolikod in 1498. But this is not Vasco's ship, this is a British ship. This is the one which then, of course we know that the, finally the British is the British who triumphed. So let me take you from Kolikod across the country to a little bit of a commercial. So this is a book I have written uh, last year and most of the material of this talk will be you will find in this book okay commercial breakover let's move to the other part of the country other end of the country so the british east india company had been set up to trade with india but what happened was that around the middle of the 18th century there was a conspiracy so there was this young nawab of bengal siraj dola and there was a conspiracy formed by some of his three of his chief courtiers his finance minister, Jagat Seth, his general Meer Baksh, um, who is generally known as Mijafar, and his main supporter king, Maharaja Krishna Chandra of uh, Krishnanagar of Nadia. So they formed this conspiracy to remove the Nawab. Now, such conspiracies were very common, they have happened across the country. But what these people did was extra, they called in the British. They called in Robert Clive. And once the result was that there was a battle. And at the Battle of Palashi was really the first example where that a European power, oops, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong things. It's, can I go back? Or oh, this one goes back? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so this was the first example which gave encouragement to the Europeans that yes, we can make conquests in India. The Indians, we can always set them off against each other and win the war. So the British came to stay. And the next result was that, of course, why did they, why had they come to India? They came to make money. So they kept making demands on the new puppet Nawab, who was the was Mijafar. You see him here in all his robes and so on. And he, they, they pressed him so badly that he said, I have no more money in my treasury. Why don't you take this piece of land and you t take all the revenues from it and, and don't bug me anymore. So this area of land, which was so Pargana, is the uh, Mughal equivalent of something like a subdivision today. So these 24 Parganas were ceded to the East India Company. So take the revenues from there, don't press me anymore. So these came to the East India Company. Now what is all this to do with science? The reason is the following, that Clive was succeeded in this by a gentleman called Robert Van Sietard. Now Robert Van Sietard realized that when they are trying to collect uh, revenue from the 24 Parganas, they didn't know whom to collect it from, they didn't know the size of the land, everything was chaos. Okay, the Mughals used to come collect something and go away. Local zamindars would collect something, they would take something, it was, it was not, there was no system. Whereas on the other hand, in England, right from the 11th century, they have had a book called the Doomsday Book. In this Doomsday Book, every house, every field, every tree was noted down. There were survey maps. There was no way you could escape one paisa of tax, or one penny of tax, I should say. 
So he decided that he has to do the same thing in the 24 persons. So he needed maps and survey maps. So he gave this job to a young sailor who knew how to make maps and his name was James Brenner. Now, don't think that he's not young in this picture. His habit to powder the hair in those days. So his hair is not white like mine, but white with powder. So James Rennell started drawing maps. And here is an example of a map drawn by Rennell in 1779. And you see that in minutely, of course, the 24 Parganas are masked, but he has gone beyond. He has also mapped most of Bengal and some parts of SM and so on. So detailed maps. So this is the first time such maps, scientific maps, were drawn in India. And this is the first example of Western science being done in India. Of course, being done but not by Indians, but by foreigners. So Clive came back to India for a second innings after Vansitar. And during that time, he was able to coax the, uh, the poor blind uh, Mughal emperor, Shah Alam II, into giving him the Diwani of Bengal, which means the entire revenue collection, not just of the 24 paragraphs, but of the entire province of Bengal, which meant everything from Benares eastward. So what comprises today Bengal, Bihar, uh, Bangladesh, Odisha, all of it together. So this huge territory, of course, now Clive also wanted it mapped. So he gave it to Rennell, and Rennell went on with his mapping. So you can see the detailed maps he drew. And there are many mistakes in this map, but that's a later point. So never before had India ever been mapped so minutely. So with this, with this mapping, that Western science started working in India. OK. At the same time, the next British leader was Warren Hastings. So Warren, of course, at that time, because Bengal had been under the Mughals, all the official work was done in Arabic and Persian. And the Englishmen who came in the industry, of course, they didn't know Arabic and Persian. So they had to employ Indian agents. And what you would expect in such a case, wherever something was worth, let us say, one rupee, the agent would, of course, say it's worth three rupees. And the British would get one rupee, the agent would get two rupees. OK? Not unknown. OK? It still happens today. But so Warren Hastings set up this college so that he would have his own trusted people, and they would also learn Arabic and Persian. Sorry, that should be Persian, not Persian. So this was known as the Mohammedan College of Calcutta. It was widely later became known as the Calcutta Madrasa. And in 2008, it was given a university status and renamed the Alia University. So you see here this very beautiful neoclassical building of the Calcutta Madrasa. It still stands. This is how it looks today. Not so beautiful because it's very congested, that area. But certainly, they also have a new campus and a new building. But I can't say that is more beautiful. Still, <laughs> that's how it looks. All right, let me now take you back, bring you back to the other end of the country, to the south, and to the siege of Srinagarpatnam in 1799, the defeat of Tipu Sultan. So, of course, we now know that Tipu Sultan was perhaps the most difficult adversary the British had to face. And one of the reasons was that he and his father Hyder Ali, they were masters of guerrilla warfare. So whenever, so, the, so remember the British didn't know the terrain. The terrain of Mysore and of South the Deccan is broken up. There are valleys, there are ravines, there are little hills where you can hide. So the British were being ambushed all the time. And they didn't have maps, so they didn't know where to hide or where people could be hiding. So the British commanders, who finally managed to defeat Tipu, were led by Sir Arthur Wellesley, who later became the Duke of Wellington and defeated the Napoleon. So he was a brilliant general. And he decided that South India, at least, has to be very mapped in great detail. So from here arose the Great Trigonometric Survey. And this was started by Colonel William Lambton, who had, was one of the soldiers who had fought under uh, Wellesley, but he also had experience in making maps and scientific maps. And later the work was carried on by Sir George Everest, 
uh, up, and it, as you can see, it took almost half a century to complete. So they drew all these maps. But remember, what is the Indian role in this? All this work was being done by Europeans. The Indian role was to fetch and carry, to carry the heavy objects, maybe to cook and eat and clean. But that was it. The scientific work was being done entirely by Europeans. So I'll just try to explain, for those who are uh, not scientists, if, so I'll just try to explain what is triangulation. So suppose you are standing here and you want to know the distance from here to that point. But you can't go there because there's a jungle in between. You can't even go around because let's say there is some water body in between. So what do you do? Instead, so you can't just tie a rope from here to here and find out the distance. But what you can do is think of a triangle like this and you can tie a rope and find the distance here because there's no obstruction here. You can also measure these angles with an instrument called a theodolite. So you know this length A and these two angles beta and gamma. You don't know the rest of the triangle but trigonometry comes into help. These are very famous results in trigonometry. So since you know these two angles, you can calculate the angle alpha from here. And since from these two equations, each of them has only one unknown. So you can calculate the other one from there. So you, at the end of the day, you know all, all the angles and all the sides of this triangle. Fine. So now you want to find out, you want to go here and find out how far this let us say is from let's say how far from here to here. You've come here, you want to go. But again, there's the water body in between. No problem, you can't stretch a rope across the water body, but you can go around and go to that point. Okay, and if you can do that, then you again, maybe you can't go from here to here, but you can again set up a triangle. And if you are at this point, you can measure this angle, you can measure this angle, you know this line from your previous calculations, so you know the effect of this triangle. And so on and so forth, you keep finding prominent points and you keep constructing triangles so that you have a grid. And that's exactly what they did. So they built exactly this grid. They started from this city. They started from the Mount of Mylapur. And from there, they kept on, worked on and worked out all these triangles right across South India. And from South India, they moved all the way north all the way eventually to the Himalayas. So with, on this basis of this grid, which was scientifically measured, then they drew the maps, which are then properly to scale. Now, by the 1820s, by the, while this map making was going on, so the British had essentially occupied, conquered the whole of the subcontinent. Now, this map is 1937, but it has not changed too much from the 1820s. So essentially these pink areas are the ones ruled directly by the British and the others were states which were vassals to them. The Indian princely states which had no political freedom. In order to do this, the British had to defeat successively the Mughals, the Marathas, the Sikhs, the Nawab of Awadhs, the, Bur the Burmese and so on. Now this long series of warfare of course, as I mentioned before, was are expensive. So by the 1820s, the East India Company was deeply in the red. They were making a loss of 1 million pounds per year. So, so now the most of the shareholders of the East India Company, they were important people. They were members of parliament, in the, you know, captain chiefs of industry, all rich people, lords and so on. So naturally they created a huge fuss. So then the British government sent out to India a man who was known for his skills at improving finances. His name was Lord William Bentinck. So Bentinck was sent out to India. So he was a distinguished soldier, but he was also the son of a prime minister of England. So very politically stable, you know, you could, you could get rid of him easily. So Bentinck, uh, was sent to India with the aim of improving the East India Company's finances. So today we remember Bentinck more for the social reforms he did, for having banned the burning of widows, the killing of female infants, for having suppressed thuggy, you know, the thugs used to strangle people. But the thing which he did, of course, he also improved the company's finances, 
by making various economies. I'll tell you some of the th other things he did. So by the time he left India, that was in 1835, the company was making a profit of one million pounds a year. So, so far as the East India Company goes, he was a very successful governor. But he also had a law member in his cabinet called Lord Macaulay. And to Lord Macaulay, he gave the job of preparing a blueprint for education in India. So Macaulay came up with this famous 19, 1835 minute on Indian education. And among the other things he said is that we must do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions who we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect and so on. And to some extent, we are all, in that sense, we are all that class of people. We are all Macaulay's children. That's why I'm giving you this talk in English. We, we do our things in English and so on. So it started from him. Now, Macaulay has had a very bad press. During the nationalist struggle, and again, it's being repeated nowadays if you have been following the news. So, he's been painted as a cunning villain who planned to train Indians in Western modes so that they would remain slaves to the English forever. And you will see this repeated by many people again. But let's see what Macaulay actually said. So, there is no doubt, of course, that he was, you know, all the things of his time, insular, priggish, patronizing, he was racist, misogynistic, all that. He was just a man of his time for that. Those we should not count, but he was a high-minded idealist. So speaking in Parliament in 1833, he said, are we to keep the people of India ignorant in order that we may keep them submissive? Or do we think we can give them knowledge without awakening ambition? Or do we mean to awaken ambition and to provide it with no legitimate vent? Who will answer any of these questions in the affirmative? Which is the way of saying nobody. Yet, one of them must be answered in the affirmative by every person who maintains that we ought permanently to exclude the natives from high office. So he is saying clearly that this should not happen. Eventually, Indians should acquire high office and through education and things. And he says, I have no fears, the path of duty is played before us. And then he goes on to say, and he is very prescient in what he says here. This is 1833. He says, it may be that the public mind of India may expand under our system till it has outgrown that system. That having become instructed in European knowledge, they may in some future age demand European institutions. Whether such a day will ever come, I know not. But it came within 50 years. This is 1835. In 1885, the Indian National Congress was formed. Indians began to demand more and more higher positions. And by 1947, we had independence. So Macaulay was right, only his time scale, his time scale was wrong. But he says, never will I attempt to avert or to retard it. The scepter may pass away from us. <coughs> the victory may be in constant to our arms, but there are triumphs which are followed by no reverses. So he was a high-minded moralist, there's no doubt. He wanted to introduce English education, not to make Indian slaves, but he genuinely believed that Indians should receive what he thought. And perhaps, to some extent, he was right, was a superior education than what they were getting in India at that time. So we'll come back to Lord Bentinck. And apart from this, Lord Bentinck also see had to improve the finances. Now he realized at that point that whatever they could draw from the Indian peasants, from the Indian middle class, from the Indian states, from the Indian princes, it had reached a saturation. They, they were taking as much as they could. So if they took more, then people would revolt. To suppress a revolt, you have to bring in soldiers. Again, it costs money, so it's not financially viable. So what is financially viable? Don't take it from the people, take it from the country, take it from the land. So exploit the natural resources of the country, which are enormous. So that is, and of course to do that, first you have to know where the natural resources lie. So he set up the Survey of India to tell us exactly where everything lies. Then he set up the Geological Survey of India. Okay, now these dates are when they acquired these names. Bentinck set up committees and so on, which eventually turned into this. So, Geological Survey of India tells you where the mineral wealth is. So, you can take that away to England. Then, Botanical Survey, Zoological Survey, the Forest Wealth of India. So, it is he who set these up. Of course, these have also become pillars of the modern Indian state. And to tell us about Indian health. 
really further the progress of Indian science. Sorry? I just said that he founded committees which later grew into these surveys. But the first things were founded by Benting, all of them. So this is also at some other date, 1851, when Benting had left. So that's when they acquired these names. So that's why they put them on the logo. OK, we'll come back to. So now, Sir George Everest, who was made the Surveyor General of India, he was surveyed a lot of mathematics, which was that plane multiplying, dividing, arithmetic. And to do that, he needed 30 computers. Now, computers doesn't mean, it doesn't mean instruments like this. What it meant was people who would actually sit with pencil and paper and add and subtract and multiply, divide, perhaps look at log tables that had been discovered by then, and do that heavy work. Very boring work, but well paid by the times. So till then, all the computers had been Europeans. So, and, and because they were Europeans, they were also being paid a bigger salary. But Lord Bentinck, of course, had come for economies. So he told them, I mean, this we are familiar with. When we ask for funds, they also cut the number. So he told them that don't take these 30 computers I can't give you. I can't give you all that money. Employ Indians and give them half the salary. Okay. So that will still be more than they can earn in any other in a place, in any zamindari or something. So give them, so you see the roots of outsourcing are very old. It's not something we, which has happened recently. It's been happening all the time. So where to find Indians who knew, know all this mathematics? So he went to the, the only one place, he went to the Hindu Mahapatshala in Calcutta, which I will talk about in a moment. And the professor of mathematics there was called John Teitler. And he recommended the names of nine young men. And he said, these guys all know, they know enough mathematics to be computers. Take them. So they were all employed by the surveyor of India. So these nine young men were the first Indians to practice modern science in India. As it happens, eight of them didn't like the work. And after one year, they all left. <coughs> Only one survived. And he's the topic of what we will, of this part of the story. And, but I'll come to that in a moment. I'll just let me tell you about the Hindu Mahapatshala. It was founded in Calcutta in 1817, it, uh, and sometimes called the Hindu College. It was later renamed Presidency College in 1858. Today it is Presidency University. This is the old building, iconic stairs. This is Raja Ramohan Roy, whose ideas led to building all. This is David Hare, who actually helped in setting up the institute. And I'm proud to say that I'm an alumnus of this uh, uh, Hallowed College. So this is where uh, Everest went to look for his computers. The only guy who survived was this gentleman. There's only one photograph of him available. Radhanath Shigda, this is how he spelled his name. And he was the first Indian scientist in modern times. And we remember him today for having computed the height of something which was known as Peak 15 of the Himalayas. Today it's called Mount Everest. Of course, it was named after Everest. Everyone says Everest now, so it has become Everest. I don't know what George Everest would have thought of this mispronunciation of his name, but it doesn't matter. So we must remember that it wasn't a solo discovery by Radhanath Shigdar. He was the chief computer, which means that he sat with pencil and paper in Calcutta. The surveying, the head of the survey of India is in Nainital. And the surveying was done from North Bihar. Now, why North Bihar, you will ask? The reason is that Mount Everest lies on the border of Nepal and Tibet. We all know that. Now, in those days, Tibet was a closed country. Nobody could enter Tibet. No foreigners were allowed to enter Tibet. And the British had a, had a war with the Nepalese. So the Nepal was close to the British. So they could not enter either Nepal or Tibet. So they had to survey it from North Bihar in the Muzaffarnagar area. So they, kept, so they, they, they took these towers. So it's, it's, it was a difficult job because that north of Bihar in those days was dense jungle, the, the, the Tarai jungles. That's the jungles where Jim Corbett used to hunt his tigers. So, so the surveyors had to go there and then do the measurements from there. It was almost a hundred miles away from Everest. 
Now when you have 100 miles distance, it's not enough just to do the triangulation. You have to worry about the curvature of the Earth and make corrections for that. You have to worry about atmospheric refraction, make corrections for that. You also have to worry about the fact that the, the, the length of the chains you are working with change with the temperature. So if you are working in the hot Indian summer, they will become long. But in those areas, it's also very cold in winter. So if the measurement is made in winter, you'll have to make the correction for that. So Sigdar was the expert in making all those corrections. And with all these corrections, he arrived at this result, that the highest peak was 29,002. So today it has become 29,035. That is because the Himalayas are slowly growing. So, and growing at a fast rate for a mountain. So th there are these things you will claim, you will find, especially on the internet, that he dis that Radhana Sigdar discovered the highest mountain in the world. No, it was already known to be the highest mountain in the world. He measured the height. He did the accurate measurement. And there are also people who think it should be named uh, Mount Sigdar. I wouldn't go with those. But what he did, and that's the solid achievement, is that he proved both to the British and to the Indians that Indians could practice modern science quite as well as the Europeans. You didn't need to have a white skin or blue eyes or blonde hair in order to do good science. You could do it as well if you were an Indian, if you had black hair, black eyes, brown skin, no problem. I think this is the important thing and in some sense he served as a role model for all Indian scientists. So all the scientists in this audience and myself, we are all in some sense followers of Radha Rajshida. We also believe that we can do it. So let me take you from Radhanath Sigda to another forgotten mathematician called Ram Chandralal. So his full, full name was Ram Chandralal Mathur. And he came, but he just he called himself only Ram Chandra. So you know, this is his picture. And he taught in the Delhi College, which today is called the Zakir Hussain Delhi College. This is how it looks today. Now, he wrote this book called The Treatise on Problems of Maxima and Minima Solved by Algebra. Of course, how do we do maxima and minima? We just use calculus, take the derivative, put it to zero and solve and you will get it. But Ramchandra had a different technique. He used various kinds of tricks and he could get the maxima and minima without any differentiation integration anywhere. So perhaps this is not needed if you are out in the field doing some engineering work. But mathematically, it's very beautiful. And the, the result was that uh, it didn't get much popularity. But when he sent it to a genuinely good mathematician, that is Augustus Morgan, De Morgan, you know, De Morgan's laws in set theory. So De Morgan was very thrilled with it. He sent copies of the book all around and wrote a foreword for this. And so in that sense, uh, Ramchandra became De Morgan's protege. Some people call him Demorgan's Ramanujam. <laughs> anyway, but here's the thing. This is Demorgan's house in London. This is now the headquarters of the London Mathematical Society, which he set up. So, among other things of, with Ramchandra, he didn't get much popularity in India, and you will not find his mention in most Indian histories. One of the reasons is he converted to Christianity. So in the national movement, he was not not given much popularity. In fact, during the war of 1857, the sepoys apparently searched from house to house looking for Ramchandra to kill him. And he managed to escape after some hair-raising experiences. Anyway, what was the result of this war? The East India Company was closed down. Sorry. I'll come to this. The Queen Victoria was declared Empress of India. and universities were founded at Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. So the, it was felt that education should be pushed further and uh, in order to prevent such things happening in the future. Okay, now let me go a little bit and talk about, see Muslims had more or less stayed away from this English education. It had been mostly absorbed by Hindus. So how did it come about? So I mean, I'll introduce you to Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, you see him here with his beard. And he was initially, so he was a sort of employee, a sub-magistrate under the East India Company. But he had, was also a Persian scholar, Arabic and Persian scholar. So the famous Aini Akbari of Abul Fazl, so Abul Fazl was Akbar's wazir, prime minister. 
and he wrote a book called Ayn Akbar. In Urdu, of course, Ayn means the ways. It doesn't mean law. Or, so the word for that is Kanun. So the Ayn means the ways and and whatever the story of Akbar's court. So he wrote this thing. But by this time, by the time of uh, of uh, Sir uh, Said Ahmed, there's a lot of inaccuracies is kept into the manuscript. So he studied all the manuscript and brought out a definitive version. And having done that, he felt that he had done a great work of scholarship. So he wanted a foreword written by a famous person. Authors do that. So whom to go to? But the most famous poet of India at that time, Urdu poet, he went to Mirza Ghalib and said, please write a foreword for me. So the tradition in this is the foreword would be written as a po in poetry. It would be a verse foreword, and the word for that is takris. Yeah. So he went to Ghalib and said, please write a takris for me. So Ghalib obliged. He said, okay, I'll write a takris for you. But when the takris came, then Sir Sayyid saw that Ghalib had not praised him at all in the takris, which is expected. What he had written, and I'll read out to you, to show you a translation of that, was the following. He had written, and this idea of his to establish its truth, that is Ayn Akbari, and edit the Ayn, puts to shame his exalted capability and potential. So he shouldn't be doing this, he's wasting his time. Then he says, I, who am the enemy of pretense and have a sense of my own truthfulness, if I don't give him praise for this task, it's proper that I find occasion to praise, that I should praise the right people. Whom is he praising? Look at the sahibs of England. Look at the style and practice of these. Science and skills grew at the hands of these skilled ones. Their efforts overtook the efforts of the forebears. The fire that one brought out of stone, how well these skilled ones bring out from means means the tinderbox. And what spell have they struck on water that a vapor drives the boat in water, so steamships. And then go to London, for in that shining garden, the city is bright in the night without candles, so gas lights. And look at the uh, businesses of the knowledgeable ones in every discipline, a hundred innovations. So he is very clear what he is telling society. Don't look back to the times of Akbar. Look forward. Try to learn and learn modern things. Very strange coming from someone like Ghalib. You don't associate Ghalib with progressiveness. You associate him with, you know, a certain kind of culture associated with the you know, decadent court of Bahadur Shah Zafar and so on. Well, so Sayyid Ahmed, the book was published, the Takris didn't appear in it. But he was stung, he stopped, he abandoned the study of Ayn and so on, and he founded the Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College in 1875. This later became the Aligarh Muslim University. And of course today it's one of today's prime universities. And it is, this was founded for the purpose of bringing young Muslim, the Muslim youths, also into the ambit of learning Western education. So, in the 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries, colleges pro proliferated all over India, and some of those colleges are still the top colleges in India. So I'll start, of course, with the Presidency College. That's well, it became Presidency in 1859. St. Xavier's College, Calcutta, was founded by the Jesuit Fathers. Of course, now it's in the news for all the wrong reasons, but it was founded by the Catholic Fathers in order to impart education. And the Scottish Church College was founded by the Protestant Fathers. So, of course, they didn't get along with each other, so founded different colleges. The same pattern repeated itself in this city. That is, the Madras Christian College was founded by the Protestants, the Loyola College by the Jesuits, same order, and Presidency College by uh, donations from rich landowners of the area. So that was in some sense quote unquote secular. And then in Bombay, same story, the, the college due to form it came with money from the rich Bombay states was Elphinstone College, St. Xavier's College, same group, and Wilson College founded by the Anglican Fathers. And then there were other things founded across India. So. Well, I don't know if you've heard of Langat Singh College. It was founded in 1899. Uh, among other, it, its most famous alumnus is Babu Rajendra Prasad, who became India's first uh, president. And Ferguson College, Pune, St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and 
technical education first started with Calcutta Medical College, was set, the first setting up of that was by Bentinck himself. Then came the Bengal Engineering College, which came in 1880 first, and the Thomaston College of Engineering, the first engineering college in India, was set up in Rurki. And today it is IIT Rurki. These beautiful buildings belong to IIT Rurki, if you've gone there. Women's education came slightly later, but it did come quite early. So the first college was again set up in Calcutta by uh, Drinkwater Bethun. So it's called Bethun College, came in 1879. The Sarah Tucker College is, I think it's in Tirunel Valley, but it's in Tamil Nadu. It's the second college to come up. And the SNDT Women's University in 1916 came up in Bombay. So SN, SN is state national something, I forgot for the details. But uh, it was, he donated the money for this. But the Sarah Tucker College, there's an interesting story associated with that. So Sarah Tucker was an English lady who lived in London, who had an accident in her childhood and was paralyzed from the waist downwards. So she was in a wheelchair. She never came to India. Her brother James Tucker was a missionary in South India. And he would write letters back to uh, his sister about the plight of Indians and you know, working with the Indians, especially about the difficult plight of women in those days. And so Sarah Tucker felt for them outside, way back in England, and she raised the subscription for the education of young girls. And so a school, Sarah Tucker School, was set up in her lifetime. It was named after her, of course. And then after her death, uh, she died young, of course, not being a very healthy person. And all her friends, who were all rich friends, they gathered together to give more money. And that started the Sarah Tucker College for women. So it's interesting that it's named after a person who, who never saw it, who never came to India, but still made her contribution. Okay. First Indian Institute, we are gradually moving there was founded by Mahendra Lal Sarkar in 1876. This is India's oldest research institute. You see a picture here of Dr. Sarkar. And his, the most famous person who worked there was C. V. Raman. This is actually from C. V. Raman's wedding photo, so he was really young at that time. So now, uh, this association initially, there were just meetings in the evening, but they felt that they needed a laboratory. The Maharaja of Vijayanagaram gave him a big grant several lakhs of rupees in those days. And so they built what is called the Vijayanagaram Laboratory. It was in these rooms somewhere that the Raman effect was discovered. Now today the Indian Association has moved from there. This now belongs to the Goenka College of Commerce. And the Indian Association has moved to this building, which I suppose quite a few people in the audience have seen or are familiar with. Okay, Indian Institute of Science and I'm going to tell you an interesting story, again, beginning with this. So in 18, so you see here, Jamshedji Tata, and you see Swami Vivekananda, and you see a ship here. So what was happening is that in 1889, both Jamshedji Tata and the Swamiji found themselves on the same ship, traveling to Yokohama, and from there they would go to San Francisco, to the US. So they became friends on the way. And uh, Swami Vivekananda asked uh, Jamshedji Tata that what are you going for? Why are you going to the US? So then Tata told him, I have this dream to set up a great iron and steel industry in India, to set up a factory. So all the steel we have today, that's ironic given that steel was invented in India, all the steel comes from England or from somewhere else. So I want to set up a steel industry in India. So I have bought up these mines in the Chhattisgarh region and the ore from there I sent it to England to get it tested and they told me the ore is very poor quality you can't get much uh, out of that you have wasted your money so we were so so then we went, what are you doing I said no I just want to go to the US myself and try to see what happens because I want a second opinion okay fine so Vivekananda told them that you will find that the Americans will give you a different view the English don't want you to make this steel factory. It eats into their profits. You will, you will find that you will not get a, get a correct answer. So why don't you set up an institute in India? Why don't you set up scientific laboratories where these tests can be done? 
where you can get scientists who will test them, where you can get a few uh, foreign scientists who will come and train Indians to do it. So it is this which provided the genesis of the IISC. Incidentally, when uh, Tata went to the US and got those uh, was tested, they told them that these have the, some of the highest content, highest hematite content in the whole world. We have never seen ore which is so rich. This is the one which comes from the ores of the Bailadilla Mines in uh, Chhattisgarh, so very famous. And um, so it brought home the truth of what Vivekananda was saying even more. So he did set up this blueprint. Unfortunately, Jamshidji Tata died before this, before any of these could be set up. So he had various projects to set up, out of which the only thing he managed to set up in his lifetime was Taj Mahal Hotel. But otherwise, the TISCO, uh, the Tata Institute, and this one, it's still called Tata Institute in, in, in Bangalore, at least by the Ottowalas. But this was actually built by his sons. So his sons were Sir Dorab Tata and Sir Ratan Tata. They are, these are the sons who actually built up the Tata industries and the Tata Empire. Okay. Now, I'll again move back. The latter half of the 19th century first produced the two first outstanding Indian scientists. And who were they? They were Sir Prafula Chandra and Sir Jagdish Chandra Bose. So Indians, we don't use that sir anymore. We give them a much more valuable uh, uh, description. We call them the Acharyas. So I'm going to now talk about the two Acharyas. So I'll speed up a little bit. So Acharya P.C. Roy, I won't tell, go through all these details. So P.C. Roy was born in, no, in Bangladesh. She was educated at Kolkata. And Sir Alexander Pedler, who lectured at the Hindu College, they influenced him to take up the study of chemistry. Then he went to Edinburgh and did his PhD, came back to England, he was appointed a temporary lecture. But see, that, that came in 1889. It took him five years to set up a research laboratory, to get money and set up a research laboratory. So during this period, the research he did was a very, very typically Indian research. What did he do? He studied adulteration. <laughs> so he studied how, what adulteration is done in mustard oil and here and how to find it out. So he found the groundnut oil, till oil, Mahua oil and fat, these are the things which are put to adulterate mustard oil. Anyway, once he found his laboratory, he made this great discovery of mercurous nitrite. I should explain to you why this is important. The mercurous radical is extremely unstable. It easily breaks up and turns into the mercuric radical or to metallic mercury. The nitrite radical is also unstable. The stable one is nitrate. So people said, you know, mercurous plus nitrite is impossible. Nobody can make such a compound. They are both unstable. But PCR was actually able to make it, showing that even if both those things are unstable, the combination is stable. So that was in some sense, it, it's even a new discovery in the theory of stability. But he was the first, and then he was hailed as the master of nitrites by his studies. Apart from that, he also wrote this two volume history of Hindu chemistry from which I quoted at the beginning of my lecture and uh, he found he's also the first example of a scientist becoming an entrepreneur he founded the Bengal chemical and pharmaceutical works then he started uh, postgraduate studies and he used to live in the university he was a bachelor he used to live in the laboratory the corner of the laboratory he used to sleep there and that's why he died also at the age of 83 so here is a picture of the Bengal chemical Factories. So in 2020, I don't know. There was, I don't know if they actually made this profit, but um, it, there are some of the, its famous products are sort of famous across Bengal. They're very popular. So phenol to clean uh, to toilets and aquatycotis if you have a stomach upset, cancerous hair oil if you're going bald, and so on. Here is a picture of the perhaps the greatest contribution made by uh, P.C. Roy and he's surrounded by all his students. So these are some of his very famous students including M.N. Saha and S.N. Bose and J.C. Ghosh and so on. But I'll have something more to say about his students. So from he, at least four of his students became pioneers in four different areas. So who were they? Nilratan Dhar, he, I'll go, uh, skip the details, but he worked on soil chemistry and the role of light in nitrogen fixation, which is the most important part of uh, 
chemistry was discovered by him. He was known as the father of Indian physical chemistry. He worked in Allahabad University. J.C. Ghosh or Sir Gyanendra Chandra Ghosh, he worked on electrochemistry and he joined the Dhaka University in 1921. He was there for many years. He became the director of ISC, then the first founding director of IIT Kharagpur, Vice Chancellor of Capital University, so many things. Eminent chemist. Also another Gyanendra, J.N. Mukherjee, he is the brought colored chemistry and soil chemistry to India. He became the director of the Pusa Institute, that's Agricultural Institute in Delhi. And he's also known as the father of Indian soil chemistry. So they were all uh, B.C. Roy students. Finally, B.C. Guha, uh, the, again, the father of Indian biochemistry. So he studied the biochemistry of vitamins, especially of vitamin C. So let's go now to the other Acharya. So <coughs> J.C. Bose, uh, similarly, he studied in Calcutta and in St. Xavier's College where the lectures of Father Eugene Lafont uh, inspired him greatly. And then he went to the University of London. Actually, he originally went to study medicine, but the smell of disinfectant, he was allergic to that. So he left medicine and took up physics, all for the better. <laughs> and uh, he joined the Christ College. He did his BSc under the tutelage of Lord Rowley and from the University of London, 1899, he got a BSc. He returned to India and started working on electromagnetic waves. So from 1894, remember they had only been discovered six years earlier. So he was a real pioneer in that. And as we know, it is he who perfected the radio receiver, which he called the Mercury Iron Career in 1896. That's what he got his BSc for. But Jesse Bose went to the Royal Society of London and gave a demonstration of his instrument. And the story is that after that, a British businessman came up to him and said, have you patented this? We both said, no. Please patent it. Let us patent it jointly, and we can make a lot of money out of this. And both said, no, I am a scientist. My work is for the world. I will not patent it. Well, he didn't patent it. Nice high moral stand. But two years later, because he had not patented and there was no official copyright law in those days, Marconi used his receiver to develop the radio and he won the Nobel Prize for it. So, and Marconi nowhere acknowledged that he had taken Bose's receiver. And it was only acknowledged more than 100 years later in 2012, and now the IEEE acknowledges Jesse Bose as the father of radio science. Well, it, the story doesn't end here. He also pioneered the study of microwaves. So things like the horn antenna, didactic lenses, and polarizers were all invented by this man. And he was also the first to use Galena crystals as semiconductor dye. So this study, entire semiconductor revolution started with the work of J.C. Bose. Again, he didn't get the recognition of it. Ferdinand and Brown won the Nobel Prize for using Galena as this. And to rub salt into the wood, he and Marconi shared the Nobel Prize, <laughs> both for things earlier done by J.C. Bose. So Sir Neville Mott has later said, Bose was some 60 years ahead of his time said it at a safe time after 60 years. So. <laughs> okay, even more perhaps brilliant, if he was 60 years ahead of his time in, in, in microwaves, he was more than 100 years ahead of his time in, in, in this uh, study of, uh, what is it called, some, uh, of, of, of neurobotany. So he invented this instrument, which you can still see in Bose Institute, this is a picture taken there, which measures very minute movements of plants. And with it, he was able to show various things, that plants have a pulse and circulation, they respond to stimuli, that they can communicate with each other. He was also able to use these to found that there's a metal phenomenon, which is today called metal fatigue. And all this led him to think that there is not so much difference between plants and metals and solid things, and inanimate things and, and animate things, which is we call panthesa. But it also led to his people dismissing him as not a scientist, but a mystic. But there was a time when a huge sensation was created. And so here, this is from the New York, what is it called? Uh, the Los Angeles uh, Chronicle, which says plants can feel and so on, picture of Bose, and all the things they can have. So he did create a sensation at the time. But after some time, he was sort of written out. Only in the last 20, 25 years have people started redoing those experiments and discovering that exactly the the interpretation may be different, but the, all his experimental results were correct. So there's a rehabilitation of Bose is happening now. 
he also brought set up a set of you know taught a set of brilliant students uh, this is another iconic picture you see sn bose bm bose uh, jc go shemensa same batch of course so this batch was very fortunate to be taught by these two great men so after he retired from residency college he founded the bose institute you see a picture of that but okay the scientific days were done so rashutosh mukherjee uh, remembered more as an educationist but he is the first person to write a mathematics paper from india the first mathem by an indian and uh, of course he later set up the postgraduate department of science and to do that to set up the science college in 1914 he persuaded two of his lawyer friends to give generous money for that what was the amount that's interesting so taraknath pale gave 14 lakhs in today's uh, currency that would be 170 crores and sir rashpuri goes gave 21 lakhs so that is 250 crores in modern languages so unfortunately there is no one who will donate so generously to science today so it's something worth thinking about anyway this beautiful building came up before that now i move quickly to sir m vishweshwaraya the most famous engineer of india in, in pre colonial times as we know he designed the krishna raj sagar dam on the kaveri and mysore and designed various other things uh, he lived beyond the 100 as you can see and he also advised on how to build this mokama bridge on the ganga in 1950 so he was just about 90 at that time so how often does a man of 90 be made a consultant to build a, build something anyway after his retirement he became Uh, the chief engineer to the government of mysore state it was a princely state in those days he became the diwan of mysore state one where was and so on i won't go into that there's a long list of things which he did so if you ever used mysore soap remember that you owe it to sai vishwasaraya and the land for iisc was granted by him on behalf of the maharaja for 1 rupee so if you got to iisc and see the sprawling campus then you know how how generous he was to science Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay, I didn't know that. All right, you see a picture here of the Krishna Raj Sagar Dam and the beautiful Brindavan Gardens, all designed by Sir Vishwasharai. If you've gone to the beautiful Brindavan Gardens, you've seen how beautiful it is. It's also very popular for shooting films. If you, if you've been lucky enough to see one of those, we, of course, I can't tell you complete the story without the story without mentioning Sri Nivas Ramanujan. but he requires an entire talk to himself which maybe you have had or will have so this is a, a picture of ramanujam this is a page from one of his famous notebooks i'll only say that ramanujam's notebooks are still being studied today new discoveries are being made every day this is from the film the man who knew infinity this is this is hardy uh, professor hardy in the film and this is ramanujam in the film pc mahanobis is the father of statistics in india i won't start, say too much about him except that he taught that he started as a physicist used to teach general relativity and then he discovered the importance of statistics and did various things set up the isis and remained director of the isis till his death he was also a member of the planning commission and oversaw the industrialization of india it was known in fact in the world at that time as the mahanobis plan apart from this is the this is his house in kolkata which is now a museum for the isi the, this is the main isi building at the back and here he had many visitors including the poet rabindranath tagore whom you see with maranavish and his wife here ruchiram sani and birbal sani ruchiram was a scientist social reformer worked in physical chemistry was a uh, more of a social reformer than a scientist but his son birbal sani founded the uh, subject of paleo botany founded in india and he worked in various things but the real contribution was to find geology and to look at uh, ancient uh, botany ancient fossils in india and this is the plan for the new institute of uh, the new building and it will come up with this birbal sani room and so on janki ammal she was the pioneering botanist and the first indian woman phd so she was originally trained at palaseri and then in madras and at michigan state university where she got her phd she trained as a botanist I forget about her phd i don't understand what nicandra phycaloides is but she became she joined the sugarcane breeding institute at coimbatore in 1932 
and there she broke she did something very interesting sugarcane of course is grown it was grown even in the west indies it was grown in india but normal sugarcane was not all that sweet jantiamal did some interbreeding and made the sugarcane yield a juice which is far more sweet since then people have only cultivated jantiamal sugarcane so next time uh, when you put some sugar in your tea remember that that has a contribution from jantiamal and there's more so see uh, there was a lot of caste and gender discrimination she found the atmosphere suffocating at coimbatore and she left for london then immediately second world war started so she worked there during the war and pandit nehru invited her to come back to india in 1951 and then she, here where she was director of the central botanical laboratory at alabad she developed some kinds of this hybrid brinjal so the typical indian brinjal is long like this which you can buy in the market but the round black ones brown black very juicy ones those were bred by janki amma so again the next time you have your brinjal in whatever form you like and if one of those remember that that is due to janki amma after retirement she worked in brc and became a, a, an environmentalist and so on you see her in the old age and we said they somebody has made a flower bred a rose and named it after janki amma so this is the great days of calcutta university when there were malana bes dm bos cv raman and meghna sah said bos sikkim mitra and bb roy so i'll sort of okay this is how they are more familiar in their pictures after aging and becoming famous and this is all described in a nice book one more commercial break by my friends gautam ganguly Anirban Kundu and Rajendra Singh about they called it the dazzling dawn the beginning of Calcutta University of course the rest of the day hasn't been so dazzling anyway i will sort of skip the details about dm boss mitra and bb roy all of them did did did, luck, did great good work and of course mn saha and sn boss we know that saha discovered the cyanization formula also built india's first cyclotron boss we remember for having discovered the both science and statistics so essentially the merit talks separate talks in themselves as to you know that i was in the activities last but not least sir cv raman till now the only indian nobel laureate working from india so even as a student he was publishing in optics and acoustics and in fact lord rally wrote to raman as professor raman but this professor raman was a 16 year old undergraduate student so you can see how he joined the finance service now audit and account service and he was posted in kolkata at a salary of 2000 rupees per month which was a huge salary in those days however after some time he quit it and took up the pallet professorship he didn't have a phd so they gave him a salary of 1000 rupees a month so how many people will come for half the salary just to do science but raman did that anyway i think the rest of the story everyone knows he discovered with krishnan the raman effect won the nobel prize for it he became director of isc the founder director rri raman research institute won the bharat ratna and so on the only thing i will add is that he, of course he was brilliant but he was also outspoken and given to many controversies so <laughs> there can be a completely separate talk about raman and 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 various aspects of his life Oh, one other thing I have to point out before I move further, he had a fantastic handwriting. Just, just, just look, look at what he's written on the board. Okay. All right. Then, of course, still the only Nobel Prize. Now we come to Azadi. So I have described all the things that happened after Azadi, before Azadi, and on 15th August we won our independence. You see, but Nehru delivering his famous uh, long years ago, we made a history of destiny speech. Now I will now just not describe individual achievements anymore. I'll just talk about a few of the major, uh, uh, major institutions which came up. And of course, I have to study. Start with the DE. Okay. So Homi Bhabha, we know about him more or less in the DE system. He founded TIFR in 1945, founded BRC in 1954, started the Atomic Energy Commission. This is BRC. This is TIFR. And as we know, unfortunately, died in a plane crash. and of course it is due to these efforts that you we had the pokhran one 
okay? If you, I don't know how many people remember or will have know about this very grainy picture of the hill which appeared after the Pokhran oil explosion. And this is a picture which appeared in all the newspapers in 1973. So for those who remember it. And uh, of course, very famously as this was communicated to the Prime Minister, in, this is Indira Gandhi at that time, saying that the Buddha, the Buddha has smiled. So this is the, the, that, this is the smile of the Buddha. Vikram Sarabhai, again, very similar background. He founded PRL, he founded ISRO, and he died very suddenly in 1971 at the early age of 52. However, it is to Sarabhai that we owe our GSLV, PSLV, a series of rockets, which have all built on the foundation created by him. Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar set up the CSIR. This is a set of some of the CSIR labs across India. Uh, there are a few more. And he uh, started with five labs, including the NPL and NCL. And he remained director general till his death. But he also died very suddenly, so a slightly older age. But uh, today we remember Bhatnagar probably more <laughs> because of the Bhatnagar Award, Bhatnagar Prize, which is given to good scientists. <laughs> this is a solemn ceremony. You can see that. You see the prime minister here. You see the then chief advisor, scientific advisor, uh, science minister, and so on. And this is the this is the award given. But we should also remember Patnagar himself. B. S. Kothari, the Alatri Kothari, is the man who really built up the UGC. It existed before he was he he was it became his director or chairman. But he is the one who built it up. He also was instrumental in building up the physics department of Delhi University, the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And uh, also the University Grants Commission, the Kothari Commission is the one which set out a detailed blueprint for education in modern India. The, the present national education policy, you will find, takes large tracks straight out of Kothari Commission report. And he was also the science advisor to the Ministry of Defense. So most of the DRDO labs, most of India's shipbuilding capacity in the, in, in the defense and so on, were all sort of conceived and started by um, uh, D.S. Kothari. And so today, we will soon see the inauguration of uh, India's first indigenously produced uh, uh, aircraft carrier. And we should remember that it was started and sanctioned by the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, and uh, who took the step that we will stop buying aircraft carriers from here and there, and we will build our own. So this is going to the success is going to be seen very soon. We are all fed because of M. S. Swaminathan. So he brought about the Green Revolution. He is also the only one of these people who is still alive, very close to 100 now. Uh, he joined the Agricultural Research Institute of India, developed various things, high yielding potato to begin with, high yielding rice, wheat, and so on. And from this kind of agriculture, it is he who brought India to this culture, agriculture. And the very fact that, you know, during the lockdown and pandemic, India didn't have to import food, we have a self-sufficient food, we even gave food to other people, is a testimony to the enormous contribution made by this man. Similarly, we should mention Varghese Kurian and the White Revolution, the availability of milk and Amul milk products and the bringing of scientific ways. Otherwise, it was a cow when you took your cow and you milked the cow and brought your pail home. But scientific production of milk was started by Varghese Kurian and he started, remember, as a nuclear physicist. And he had to decide at one time whether he was interested more in nuclear physics or in milk production. He chose wisely or not milk production. <laughs> anyway, he created the Amul Cooperative, and uh, you see this picture here. He also lived to exactly 100 years. See, so died last year. And of course, Amul is also famous for the very beautiful Amul cartoons. Cartoon. So this is a cartoon they made uh, two years, three years back, at the height of the farmer agitation. <laughs> and this is the one they have produced this year the 75th year of independence. So they are always, always very much up with the times. And here is the still from the film Manthan, which is Shambhanegal film describing the early struggles of, of Kurian in setting up a cooperative. 
IIT is founding, IIT is another success story of modern India institutions. So first conceived by Sir Ardashir Dalal, who was an ex-manager of Tisco, who had become, uh, on, came on the Vice Chancellor, Vice Roy's Executive Council. So he said we should set up these institutes on the model of MIT. But the details were worked out by the Nalini Ranjan Sarkar Committee, but even before that had made its report in 1950, Sir Dr. B. C. Roy, the West Bengal, Chief Minister of West Bengal, provided the entire Hijli Jail campus. So here's a picture of the old Hijli Jail. So of course after independence it wasn't needed because it was used to house, uh, the, house the freedom fighters. So it was entirely given to build the new campus. And Sir J. C. Ghosh moved from the ISC to become the first director of IIT, Kharagpur. The IIT Act, which is essentially written by Sir J. C. Ghosh, was passed in 1956 and the IITs became institutes of national importance in 1961. So four new IITs, of course, this is the present building of Kharagpur, and four new IITs came up at Bombay, Kanpur and Madras together, and Delhi. And today we have 23 IITs across the country. And I don't know, we will, will we have an IIT Taramani soon? Perhaps. Anyway. Last but not least, there is Rajkumari Amritkaur. I don't know how many people have heard of her. She belonged to the Kapurthala royal family. She was educated at Oxford. She became a freedom fighter and acted as Mahatma Gandhi's secretary for many years. She founded the All India Women's Conference. And from Women's Conference, you know, she, she moved into social, a social worker, especially education, you know, child health, uh, you know, helping women in childbirth and so on. So in the first cabinet of Free India, she became the health minister. And then she conceived of the first AIMS. The first AIMS came up in her own house, which she had donated. This is where it was. Of course, this was not her house. That house has fallen to bits. This is a new building. She was declared the Time Woman of the Year, 1947. And of course, AIMS is almost always in the news. This is the first dose of co-vaccine which was given in, uh, in the AIMS Delhi. And this is a scene which you must have seen. Okay, this is where all the new aims are coming up. The black ones, the red ones are already there. New aims coming up all across the country. So we'll have an aims taramani at home stage. And finally, this is a scene which you have seen many times over the last two years. With uh, you know, for advice in in times of crisis, you do go to the aims director. So uh, I've exceeded my time. Let me finish by reminding of a slogan coined in the 1960s by Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan. And after the Pokhran blast, you may remember that uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee added to it by saying, Jai Vigyan. So Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, and Jai Vigyan. So I, on that note, I'll end this talk. And of course, there is something we can all say <laughs> with that. And that is Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Roy Chaudhary, for this exciting, yeah. wonderful talk, exceptional talk. I think you must be tired after such a long talk. So before we take questions, may I request our director and our registrar to felicitate Professor Roy Chaudhary for this wonderful talk. Thank you. where the photo photographers can take us. Thank you. Very well, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. That will be welcome and I'll I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, please. Questions? Prasamurti first. Viru, thanks yeah. for this wonderful talk. Welcome. Uh, there is one comment which I yeah. want to mention, uh, make here, which is there is uh, one more connection between Raman, Calcutta, and IACS. Before he started his work on Raman effect and spectroscopy, he was actually working on uh, Indian musical instruments, and in I fact. 
uh, Arthur Bernadette, who came after him, describes him as the father of musical field of musical acoustics. Yes. And all those papers were written in when he was working in Indian uh, that uh, cultivation of science. Thank you. Yes, that is true. And even after he became uh, the Palit professor in Calcutta University, yes. he was working on those musical instruments. Yes. And uh, also, you know, he was an expert in this field of wave vibrations and light and yes. so on. So I can tell you of two personal experiences which might be useful. One is that when I was studying in Calcutta University, then there used to be an old piano in the lecture room. It was in bad condition. And if you opened the piano, maybe rats would jump out of it. But, <laughs> but it turned out that that was Raman's piano. So during the 175th, uh, no, the 100th year of Calcutta University Physics Department, that piano has been restored. Mm -hmm. It has been restored. It is now they have kept it in a separate thing under it. And so it, so that's that. So th that piano was not for it was not for playing. It was for doing experiments. The other thing is that we used to do an experiment in the lab, which was very beautiful, which was a, a way to study a, a liquid, but by having a vibrator and setting up a standing wave pattern in the liquid, and then the density difference would make it look like a diffraction grating. So you measure the grating constant, that gave you the wavelength, and from there you could measure the viscosity of the liquid. That's a brilliant idea. I mean, and we learned that this experiment was set up by Raman. So many, many things. It's not, you don't become a Nobel Prize laureate for nothing. One, one more comment is that uh, when you are starting the development of modern science in India, what would you say about uh, Tipu's rockets? Because I heard an hour long talk by Ramasheshan on the metallurgy involved in making those uh, uh, cylindrical containers. Yes. The strength that was required in order to launch a wrong care or yes. launch the ammunition which would go up to four kilometers. I know. Yeah. But my understanding was that Tipu had a lot of help from French engineers. So Tipu's rockets were not all indigenous, but you know the indigenous steel making had sort of died down by then. Uh, so the, yeah. most of the technology for Tipu's rockets and even Tipu's famous tiger which you know you may have seen in, in Mysore, these were, these all came from French it came from the French. The French supported Tipu strongly, of course, as you know. Yeah, they, he might have got the technological help. Yes. But apparently, the idea of uh, reinforced steel, where he would make steel ropes, and they would go around. They would be tied around, and then the metal would be. Uh, that could be. Yeah, uh, that could be. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that detail. It's an interesting I thing. I think Ramshishan probably has written an article. I'll read it up. I'll read, but I, I'm not familiar with the details. But I do know that Tipu relied very heavily on French uh, technology. Yeah, he did. Yeah. But he also had his own. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Innovations. Of course. Uh, hello. Can I ask? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm here. <laughs> okay. I can't yeah. see you. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was definitely an excellent talk covering the whole period. It is very difficult to give uh, such a talk of uh, covering, but I just wanted to find, mention a couple of them. Yeah. When you say the dark period, it's mostly confined to the northern part of India. Mm -hmm. At the time between 800 to 1400, the Chola kingdom here was really flourishing. And their shipbuilding and other activities were extraordinary that they were able to go to the Indonesia and uh, Thailand and other places. And uh, yeah. definitely all the work of uh, um, bronze me metallurgy was very strong in the period. Yes. And uh, secondly, uh, even astrology and astronomy were more or less going together. Even if you take people like Varahamira and uh, this thing, they were both playing the role and probably pleasing the rulers by giving astrological advices, but they were following astronomical things. And uh, one more minor comment is uh, the Gindi Engineering College was formed much before any of these, in 1795, it was okay. before much, before okay. all the institutions which you have pointed out, okay. which was also really extraordinary. Okay. That's what uh, I thought I would okay. mention. So, lastly, I yeah. thought probably you could have mentioned about G. N. Ramachandran. 
around 1950, so, exactly at the time when he did one of the outstanding work from these areas, which probably we can think of including. All right, you've raised four issues, so let me try to answer them one by one. I think the first one was your mention of the Chola kingdoms and so on. So that it is true. So, but I would still say that the spirit of free science and inquiry was not so strong. What we do see is technology and the actual technology of building ships was not new. It was old, old technology. So they were certainly very prosperous and strong. And of course the wonderful temples they built still exist. But again that, that's old technology. So I don't see any, uh, at least I have not read of any innovations made in that comparable for example with the innovations being made by the Kerala school. So that's my answer to that first part. Now there I just wanted to comment. Yes. Such temples building where technology is one of the issues definitely requires, we do not know many of the details about that thing, which is not, probably it requires more amount of work. That's what yeah, I... Yeah, that's true. I accept that. Mm -hmm. But be behind a temple, or you, want, you, see, you only see the finished product, there's mm -hmm. a lot of backroom work which goes on. Yes. I, I accept that. Okay. Uh, that's the, what was your, after, now I forgot, what was your second point? Gindi Engineering College. The Gindi Engineering College, I didn't know about it, so I will certainly read it up and mention it. And last there was the, also one more, one hmm. more medical college, yes. which is now Jipmer, which came up in Pondicherry, which yes. was the French, and that also came up very early. Very early. However, uh, uh, that I have read about, hmm. the French would give a degree to the people there, which allowed them only to treat Indians. They could not treat them. So I'm not sure about the, what they thought about the quality of the education they were giving. But certainly that thing existed. It became Jipmer, of course, after Nehru's death and so on, after independence. Okay, your And sir? also the, the meteorological work or also observatory, which was there in Madras in 18th century itself, in 19th century, it was in fact first to suggest even the possibility of exoplanet. In fact, they were in fact proposing the model for that. In fact, well, I'll have to now listen to your talks. <laughs> so, okay. But uh, the last one which you raised was oh, about GN Ramachandran. Well, not only GN Ramachandran. See, in the post-independence era, not only GN Ramachandran, there were many others. There was Pancharatnam, yeah. there was Vagavantam, there was uh, K.S. Krishnan, there was uh, Subhash Mukhopadhyay, the test tube baby story you know about. There was Rai Chaudhary, Vaidya. Many, many achievements. I have not talked about the individual achievements because I have to stop my talk somewhere. <laughs> okay. So I talked only about the major institution builders after independence. So someday perhaps in the future. So what happened to the Kerala School of Mathematics after uh, 1730? I think the last person was Narayana Bhatta. Three yes, Narayana Bhatta. Well, the trouble with the Kerala school, this is of course from what I've heard and read, I'm not competent to judge, but the problem was that they kept it within a very small group of people and that, that died out because it didn't spread out. So in fact, I had heard from uh, an expert who was giving this talk that in order to keep it only within that particular school, all, you know, the ten tendency in India was not to write these mathematics in, in symbols, but to write it in verse. So they would make the verse deliberately complicated so that other people could not read and understand it. For example, I mean, they would use symbols. For example, when they meant one, they would write Surya because there is one Surya. <laughs> when they wanted to write two, they would say Ashwin, which meant two Ashwin, two Ashwin Kumas. So, you know, they were not willing to spread it out, out. So it stayed within that school, within that. And the result is that when that school stopped, you know, every school at some stage or other doesn't, you know, doesn't always come up with a set of brilliant Guru Shishya Parampara. So, so when they had mediocre people, it, it's died a natural death. Which, which is the importance of, importance of publishing our work. Um. So, I actually had one other question, yeah. which is that uh, we hear about lot of uh, people who come to India and then describe India and so on, like for example Al Biruni or Fahin and so on. But do we have accounts of people who have gone from India and written about other countries in Indian languages? Say? Not before the 18th century, okay, but not before the 18th century. 
But before that, I should say something about the people who came to India. Most of them were simple adventurers or travelers. They wrote this and that. But Al-Biruni was not like that. Al-Biruni was a scholar. So Al-Biruni tried to pick up as much about Indian science and Indian knowledge as he could. And then he, it is from his works, and he also quietly appropriated some of it and declared it as his own discoveries. Okay. So, but Al-Biruni's uh, introduction of the Islamic world, it, I know while, while in the Islamic domains in India, science and knowledge was sort of dying, dying a slow death. In the Islamic world, this knowledge set off a tremendous growth. So the Islamic schools, you know, you'll find them beautifully described in Salam's Nobel lecture. You know, people like Al-Khwarizmi and uh, what is this fellow's name? What the, this, uh, chemist, what's his name? Uh, Ibn Rashid and so on. They all grew out of this, you know, it is the impetus given by this. That's why you know that even words like sine, cosine, all these things originate from Indian words. So that came, that happened there. It's a sort of paradoxical. And from, of course, it is from the Arabs that the science went to Europe, modern science. So in that sense it went that way, but of course the, the development was different. So by that time it had died down. It came back again with the invaders. Questions? Final question. Yeah. Um, do you think there is any relevance of the so-called Hindu science which you had mentioned in the you know modern science today? Could uh, can you do any calculation without a zero? I mean, what I... <laughs> Can you build a house without steel? Uh, Can you do surgery without implements? I gave you four examples. Like, I don't mean it in that sense. What I meant is yes. more like uh, the way it was done in terms of uh, these pros, I mean... We don't, know how it, we don't know how it was done. We have only mm -hmm. these manuscripts and little bits of references. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, suppose, suppose somebody tells you writes in a writes a paper which is a two line paper saying i have made the discovered that so and so and so and so have the following properties they don't tell you about the labs they don't tell you about their processes they don't tell you about how they did it you discover this after a few thousand years how will you know you only know that this thing knowledge was there so that's the kind of thing you know they did not bother the way you write a scientific paper today is you start by describing all your processes and all your steps so that what you are describing will be accessible to everybody. But in the ancient world it was not like that. You were a wise man, you had your knowledge, you told people, look, I have this knowledge. So it's, you know, it's, a way, it's the way the ethos has changed. That is why Western science has this advantage. That Western science presents itself in such a way that if you don't need anything extraordinary, you don't need to do tapasya, you sit, you sit, you study it sincerely, you will be able to follow. I think that is one major difference between the way science was done, not only in ancient India, it's everywhere in the ancient world and in the modern world. It's this idea is that it should be accessible to all, completely transparent. Before that, we need to really thank Professor Shiro Prachotri for his exceptional talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.